uh, we're going to look at another carol this evening with with Stephen. But uh, let's let's start with prayer, shall we? Just bringing the evening before the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful that um, you are like a rock for us in troubled times. And um, when we're tempted to uh, be discouraged, tempted to uh, be shaken, uh, we just stand firm on you. And thank you that at Christmas we remember um, the truth of your love for us in Jesus. And as we reflect again on a, a carol that... Um, takes us to the heart of the gospel, we pray that you would uh, set our hearts on fire uh, fresh with love for you and refocus our minds, Lord, uh, on those things that are important for us today. Amen. 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 Well, if you'd like to mute yourselves as we normally do, and I'll let Stephen, Stephen, don't you mute yourself, but everybody <laughs> else can, and then Stephen's going to introduce this carol, um, and uh, we'll listen to it as well, and then uh, Stephen, if you want to lead us in a bit of discussion afterwards, that would be fantastic. Okay, well, um, uh, great to be back uh, here again. This is the fourth of, uh, uh, of a series of Christmas carols, I say this really for John and Andy's benefit, during the course of Advent. Uh, the first two of which um, were carols which are anonymous uh, and which are either medieval or had medieval roots and therefore go back a long way. And last week's Jesus Christ the Apple Tree, one that was composed in the 18th century by somebody who uh, for a long time we didn't know, but a piece of clever detective work that I talked about last week tracks, tracks it down this uh, uh, Calvinist Baptist pastor who had written it. Um, uh, and it too had some medieval symbolism embedded in it. This week, uh, we turn to something rather different. Um, in, in this case, the words are by somebody who is well known, um, who was one of the arguably most important figures of the uh, English religious uh, of the uh, 18th century. And its music uh, is attributed to a composer who is also well known, namely Handel. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about both Watts and Handel uh, as we get into it. Um, but this is the um, uh, carol of the, all four that we're looking at that has got substantially the oldest music of them all. Um, and its words date from 1719. So it's the beginning of the 18th century, really on the threshold of the great movement that we've come to know as the Enlightenment. And I want to talk a bit about that too. Um, but let's first listen to it. Uh, this is, I think, a, it's an American um, uh, 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 video um, set in a lovely great concert hall, and it's a marvellous, rousing presentation of Joy to the World.
so uh, that was a slightly grainier video. Uh, I, I, actually, I thought it, I may be wrong about saying that was America. It may have been, it said Plymouth, maybe it was Plymouth, Devon, England. Um, uh, the text, as I say, dates from 1719, and it's a loose interpretation, loose being the word, of Psalms 96 and 98, uh, two Psalms which in some ways overlap with each other quite a lot. And I'm going to get Andy to read Psalm 96 very shortly. But I wonder if just first, uh, 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 Andy, we could, um, well, actually, if we could put up the Psalm and, and would you mind reading it? Okay. Um, I'm going to read it. I'll put the words up afterwards, actually. I've not prepared those ones, but can I, can I just read it and then put the words yeah, up afterwards? Actually, then we'll go straight to the text of the, the carol. Oh, okay. Yeah. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Thank, thanks, Andy. And if you could put up the words of the carol. There we go. Thank you. And you can see, if you were listening to the psalm, the, the, the way in which this is a pretty loose interpretation, but it picks up the two main thrusts of the psalm. Firstly, the sense that the whole of creation uh, is called to celebrate the arrival of the king. The Lord is come, let earth receive her king. And then that second verse, rocks, hills and plains, white, sorry, white, hill, white fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. And then secondly, uh, that all the peoples of the world are called on to recognize the glory of his name. And so you get in that third verse, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. And that uh, reminds us, I think, uh, of a theme that comes up several times in different places in the Old Testament. Um, the sense that uh, God is out not merely to remake, remake human individuals, uh, but actually to remake the world. You get this particularly in Isaiah, uh, where uh, one famous passage says, "He, it is too small a thing from, to be my servant to restore the tribes of Israel. See, I also make you a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And then there are other passages in Isaiah and elsewhere, which uh, imagine a world where uh, the, 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 the violence of nature is taken away and peace and tranquility and harm, harmony break out as part of uh, the full arrival of God's kingdom. So there's a lot of rich Old Testament resonance that's captured uh, in a very summary form in these uh, three verses. Andy, do you want to take the words down now? Thank you. That's great, thanks. So who was Isaiah, Isaac Watts, the composer? Uh, born in uh, 1674, died 1748, so by the standards of that time, lived to a fairly ripe old age. Um, he uh, is a remarkable figure, actually, not well enough known. A remarkable figure because he was, um, uh, first of all, he was a clearly a child prodigy, recognised as such from very early years, born in Southampton, in fact, into a nonconformist family. 
and as a result of that fact couldn't go to university at a time when you had to be an Anglican uh, to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and so he came to London instead and in fact lived all his life in and around London um, and was taken up by a particular nonconformist grandee who had a substantial um, house in what, the then village of Stoke Newington um, and, uh, and lived there for much of his working life. And in the course of that working life um, became increasingly well known um, in, in, in several different dimensions that this is not, this is not a, 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 a sort of a monochrome individual. He was a philosopher. He was a well-known academic philosopher. Uh, he was a uh, poet and a hymn writer and he was an activist campaigner for the reform of worship in public church life. Uh, he became a very well-known figure in, in his own lifetime uh, and a very successful one, in, as, you, as we'll see in a second, with his publications. Um, as a philosopher, he, he wrote about the big theme that bothered everybody at that time, the relationship between reason and revelation. Revelation, the, the scriptures, what the scriptures told you, this is what is so, what did your reason tell you, and, how, and could you marry those up effectively? This was the big issue um, that, uh, that, that troubled people like Isaac Newton, um, uh, John Locke, the great English philosopher of about a century earlier, um, and others into the 18th century. Uh, he also bothered about the relationship between uh, what he called reason and passion, and what he meant really is the mind and the heart, and how do you engage both of those in worship and in your Christian life uh, on a daily basis. And he wrote extensively about all of this. Um, he wrote very widely published books about all of this, and uh, uh, when he was writing just about mathematical logic, uh, a subject which will not uh, have sent many uh, uh, hearts throbbing, um, but he did write this book, and it became the standard textbook of Oxford and Cambridge for something like 100 years after his death. So Isaac Watts was a significant uh, intellectual force in his time. But he was also more than that. Um, he's also a uh, gifted poet and hymn writer. Um, hymns that he is well known for and are still in, in the current repertoire, so to speak. Um, perhaps the greatest of them all is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Um, another one, Our God, Our Ho O God, Our Hope in Ages Past. And Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. Those are all Isaac Watts. And then this one that we've just heard, uh, Joy to the Lord, joy, joy to the world. He had a gifted use of imagery. Not all of his poetry is very high grade, it must be said. And he wrote over 600 hymns in total, many of which have not survived. Um, well, sorry, they've survived, but, but would not be, people wouldn't really want to use them these days. Uh, but those four that I've mentioned will of course be in, in, the, in the books for all time, I suspect. Um, and if you look at the way at his best that he used poetry, you see, for example, this verse in, which comes from When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, his dying crimson like a robe spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then I am dead to all the world and all the world is dead to me. That marvelous image of the dying crimson like a robe. Or in O oh God Our Help is in Ages Past, uh, there's a lovely verse in that which goes as follows. Time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. What a vivid image of transience that is. Um, the equal, I think, of any poetry on the transits of life that you'll, that you'll ever find. So there it is, uh, 600 hymns in total. That compares with the 6,000 that Charles Wesley wrote. Um, if, if you look at the ratio of hymns that he wrote to the ones that are still in common use, it's probably six out of the six, 600 or so, but that's about the same ratio as in the case of Charles Wesley, uh, many of whose thousands of hymns have not survived into current usage, but, uh, but, but the, some of the greatest will be with us for all time. And he published his hymns. He published uh, hymns that he called Psalms of, here, here's the title, and this is one of these wonderful kind of 18th century long titles, Psalms of David in the language of the New Testament interpreted and applied to Christian state and worship. That was the title of his book of uh, things like Joy to the World, actually, where he's taken 
uh, psalm and loosely interpreted it and Christianized it in inverted commas uh, into a modern hymn uh, in, in its form. He published another hymn book called Hymns and Spiritual Songs and a third one which was specifically for children, children's songs of worship. And he was extremely popular as I've mentioned but particularly in the United States in America. They weren't the United States then, in, in the colonies of America. Um, uh, and indeed, for much of the 18th century, his hymns were the most published book in the whole of the United States, except, except for the Bible. It's quite a thought. Now, he wasn't the first to write hymns, of course. It was George Herbert, famously. George Herbert is, is 100 years older than that. Um, and of course, in the German Lutheran tradition, they were writing hymns for a couple of hundred years before, uh, before, um, uh, before Isaac Watts. But he was the first person to produce hymns in such volume. And although he is not as great a hymn writer in total as Charles Wesley was, he in a sense opened the way for Charles Wesley. He, he, he demonstrated that it was possible to write hymns uh, uh, en masse and to have them published and be very successful at it. Uh, and then Charles Wesley, uh, as it were, followed in his wake um, just a few decades later. So that's him as a uh, poet. Uh, and then, he's, uh, then there's Isaac Watts as the reforming activist who wanted to renew church life. And it's worth dwelling for a moment on this. The 17th century, the, the century in which he had been born and grown up, was one in which church life in England um, really had two, two forms. You were either High Anglican uh, or you were Puritan. Um, uh, Puritan, of course, had many specific forms, Baptist uh, um, and various other kinds of forms. Um, but, you, but, but, but those were the two main forms of religious expression in the England of the 17th century. And for a while, the Puritans uh, became the dominant force over the time of the Commonwealth. Most of the time, they lived uneasily side by side. Um, and what um, uh, and what characterised them, as far as their worship was concerned, was a sort of dry liturgical dogmatism. Um, the only the only singing that took place in worship, it, whether it was in the Puritan or in the High Anglican traditions, was of metrical psalms uh, to rather um, traditional Elizabethan music. Um, uh, and the preaching was often dogmatic rather zealous sometimes. And Watts reacted against this. He said, it's too dry. It doesn't inspire. The Psalms in any case need some interpretation and some Christianizing and not just through sermons about them, um, but they need to be reinterpreted in, into hymns which people can sing and therefore join in worship uh, and engage, to go back to with the earlier point, not just their minds, but their hearts in worship. This is, um, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to appreciate how new this was in the early 18th century. Uh, and Watts not merely went on to interpret the Psalms in hymns like Joy to the World, but to compose brand new hymns, uh, and uh, the best example of which is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. He also deliberately set out to achieve a kind of more, a, a, more, a, a, more, a wider impact. Uh, so he wrote and talked about how to preach, how, how prayer should be done, how worship should be conducted. Uh, he, this was a deliberate campaign to reform the way churches did worship. He became, as I mentioned, very popular, particularly in the US. I don't quite know why that's true. He never went there. Um, it is interesting to note uh, not merely that the, uh, his hymns were so popular, as I've already mentioned in the US, but also that Joy to the World was a hymn that was almost unknown in England into the, well into the 20th century. And in fact, if you look at the two traditional hymn books of the Anglican Church of the 20th century, the Hymns Ancient and Modern and the English Hymnal, roughly Is speaking... It going to disturb you, Alfie? roughly speaking, low conservative and higher Anglican, those two, neither of them had Joy to the World in them. So it's not really until um, the influence of America started to grow uh, in, I think, in the second half of the 20th century, really, that Joy to the World, having crossed the Atlantic in one direction, crosses back and becomes the popular carol that it now is in this country as well. 
I actually have a first memory. I can remember clearly when I first heard it. Uh, and I don't know where Jay can. She's on the line somewhere. That I can't see her at the moment. Um, oh, there she is. No, I can. There she is. Uh, I, this was actually in 1973 when we were. I was a student in Boston, Massachusetts, and we spent Christmas 1973 uh, with some distant cousins of Jay's who lived in Detroit or near Detroit. And we drove across there, and, and, and it's the first, first and actually only white Christmas that I've ever had, um, because there was thick snow around. And we went to the church, and they sang "Joy to the World," and it's the first time that I remember ever hearing it. It has, of course, since then become an extremely successful carol, in part because of the very successful arrangement that we heard earlier by John Rutter. Um, so that's that's the words. Um, and thanks to Isaac Watts for one of the most memorable and lovable carols of them all. I want to say in just a few more minutes worth about the music. The music um, in the form that we now know it, apart from having been arranged by John Rutter, as just mentioned, was composed or arranged, as he described it, by one Lowell Mason, an American composer of the mid, uh, early, early 19th century, actually. In 1836, he published it. Um, as an arrangement. Uh, Lowell Mace, Mason is not a particularly well-known name to us. You'd have to be a real aficionado of, of, of kind of second tier of 19th century American composition to have heard of him. Um, uh, but he did write Nearer My God to Thee uh, as one, one well-known hymn tune. And he did write Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, so he's left a few traces uh, for posterity. Um, but this is arguably his most important um, musical contribution, the arrangement of this uh, uh, very memorable tune, which he attributed to Handel. Now, scholars have argued about uh, whether he was right to do so. Um, the tune is called Antioch, and the, and, the, and the Antioch tune was around at that time with attribution to Handel, um, but there were also versions of it that would have simply said anonymous. And as I say, scholars have argued, and, and, and far be it from me to argue with them. I would say that there are two very clear references to Handel's Messiah in that tune. If you listen to it carefully, um, maybe you'd like to sometime after, after this, that first of all, the opening phrase, bomb, 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 is the same as the opening phrase of Lift Up Your Heads, one of the cho choruses of, uh, of, um, of the Messiah. And the third line, is the same as the opening instrumental passage for Comfort Ye My People. So there are obvious echoes there, which uh, most people do not believe were there by chance. And whether or not Handel wrote the thing in the form that we've now got it, what is very clear is it is either Handel or somebody who was deliberately imitating Handel. And it's certainly very Handel-like. This is a piece of Baroque music. Now, Baroque music, um, early, uh, Handel, by the way, had almost uh, about 10 years younger than uh, uh, um, uh, Isaac Watts, um, born about 10 years after him, died about 10 years after him. Um, uh, one, one of the two or three greatest Baroque composers, of course. Baroque was new-ish at that time, and we're quite familiar with it. What, again, we need, we won't easily appreciate is what an extraordinarily effervescent um, new music it was to ears that had been used to listening to the music of the 17th and 16th centuries. Um, this was music, uh, by the way, uh, that was that turned up in theatres, in operas. Um, it wasn't just uh, uh, religious music. Handel, of course, was known for, for his operas more uh, until later in life and, and before he got onto oratorios on scriptural themes and to and onto the Messiah, he was known for writing rather frivolous Italian operas. Um, and this Baroque music not only had a, an effervescence and a liveliness to it that was completely new, but it also drew in people who uh, had no very obvious um, natural affinity for, for church worship, if I can put it that way. It, it, it reached out much more broadly to the musical ear of the time. And so it was exciting. And so you've got uh, uh, here something that came together, the new words of uh, Isaac Watts interpreting Psalms in a lively form that could be easily uh, chanted or sung by ordinary people, ordinary congregation members, and the music which thrilled and delighted uh, and you could hear on a London stage if you wanted to. And these two 
means of expression come together to reflect what can only be described as a new spirit of, uh, mu uh, of worship, uh, a spirit of worship in modernity. And I say that because remember also that Isaac Watts was the man who was seeking to reconcile reason and revelation, was se seeking to reconcile the scientific um, curiosity and excitement of the Enlightenment with his religious faith uh, and bringing all this together in a new approach to worship. And so what you've got is something that is in a way confident, um, in a way confident and excited and exciting uh, as I think this carol is. Also conscious of wrong and dissatisfaction and yearning for something better as we saw in last week's carol. And as you see, if you listen to the words carefully of when I survey the wondrous cross, which has of course a very different mood to it. It was a world too that was conscious of man's place in the wider world of, uh, of a planet and indeed of creation more broadly. It was, if you like, enlarging uh, the sense of Christ's work of redemption. Indeed, uh, uh, Isaac Watts very specifically said that it, we, we needed to do that, to enlarge, our, 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 our deepen our understanding of Christ's work, not merely of saving the individual, um, but of redeeming the cosmos, the whole remaking of reality. This was his understanding of what the Bible, in those passages I alluded to a little while back, and of course you get later on in the New Testament as well, uh, is really telling us. So this was something new and fresh, uh, and there's a fundamental Christian optimism about it. And hence you get one of the most memorable and lovable carols of them all, and uh, I'll, I'll finish simply by saying, boy, don't we need a bit of uh, confident optimism at the moment, given, our, uh, given, given what we got, we're all of us going through. I'll stop there, Andy. I wonder if we could perhaps just play the, uh, the, 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 the carol again whilst we collect our thoughts a bit. Thank you, Andy. Well, 
so many different things there we could pick up on, aren't there? Um, let's open it up for discussion and uh, reactions or questions maybe to Stephen about that. Um, how has that resonated with different people? Do unmute yourselves if you would like to make any comments or questions or, or, or um, remarks. Uh, let's open it up, shall we? See where it takes us. I think it was in the States though. Uh, first um, Plymouth sounds sounds like it was an American church, doesn't it? It, looked, it certainly looked like one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got a very obvious first question, Stephen. Um, what's the link with Christmas? Well, the link, I should have said, it, the link is with Advent, isn't it? It's not really, not with, it's, it's, it's an Advent carol rather than a Christmas carol, I should have said that. Um, um, you know, the Lord has come, and, and as always with Advent, there's this, um, there's this double meaning, the Lord is coming, meaning at Christmas, and coming uh, in the fullness of the age, at the end of the age, at the end of time, and uh, this, is, this is an Advent carol. It's like in that sense, like "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel," which is which is a, which is an Advent carol rather than a Christmas carol. Yeah, as one or two of you know, uh, although I am very much a religious person, you know, I don't go to church much or practice much. But when it comes to talking about hymns such as this one and carols such as this one, what have you? They've stood the test of time, haven't they? And when people think about Christmas, when they think about Easter, there's certain writers, there's certain carols, there's certain hymns that hundreds of years old, and they're the ones that we immediately think about, and they bring back, probably, like for me, memories of my youth. You know, and I think that's that's an excellent link, especially around Christmas time, which is obviously a bit of an emotional time as well, isn't it? Mm. And uh, just linking in with, you know, some of the people you've talked about writing these things, Stephen, and how they've formed quite patterns through our lives when it comes through our education and how they all link together. It's so very interesting mm. when in just, what, half an hour, less than half an hour, you can pull so many of them together you know, and we, we all can understand exactly what it's uh, all referring to. Very good, very interesting. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad you, glad, glad you found that. It's, uh, mm. uh, you're right, uh, for, for all of us, these car carols conjure up memories of the past one, one way or another. And indeed, I talked about the, mem the specific memory this one conjures up for me, and, but we'll all have our own memories that, that carols trigger and Christmas triggers. So great because the words are so fantastic, and so is the music, which is a terrific combination, isn't it? Which is why yeah. <clears throat> we love it so much. And I'm now interested to find out more about Isaac Watts. Well, I, I, I've enjoyed doing this because I learned a whole lot by, by, by kind of having taken this on. I thought, what am I going to say about Joy to the World? And you start digging into uh, Isaac Watts, and, and he, he is a much more interesting figure than I had appreciated. Yeah. Well, thank you, Stephen, for all the hard work that's obviously <laughs> gone in. I found it absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's just a reminder of how, it, for all of us, uh, it's worth digging into some of these uh, wonderful hymns and carols and uh, uh, going a bit deeper to find out more about uh, the authors and the musicians and uh, their origin. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I, I, um, I used to teach a, a, a class um, when I was in France on English um, theology or, and I used some hymns often to get people to think about, you know, the, the, the ideas and, and one of the hymns I used was When I Survey and uh, I was always struck by the intensely sort of emotional nature of that, of that hymn, the way that it's so incredibly personal and um, uh, almost intimate in the way that it describes the effect of Jesus' death. Um, but I'd never thought or never realised that Isaac Watts was also a scientist. And I'm just really intrigued that there's a sort of, because we often think of the, like a real tension between those who are more on the emotional side and those who are more on the rational side. And here we've got an incredibly rational 
a mathematician who's also capable of writing the most emotional, spiritually intense things. It, it, it's just an extraordinary thing, isn't it? I mean, was that common at the time? Were there, were there lots of people like him? That Was, it, was there not a, the sort of separation we imagine, imagine nowadays? Because if, I mean, it's just incredible to have somebody of his sort of stature spanning both of them and, and not seemingly seeing a, a contradiction between them, but actually wanting to bring together reason and, and sort of deep emotional faith. I, I, I don't know enough to answer how, how unusual he was. I mean, clearly he was unusual merely by his giftedness. Um, um, but Isaac Newton was also a, a, a very religious man. And I think the, the modern uh, assumption that, that, that if you're a scientist, you're not religious uh, is probably, is probably I suspect, I don't know whether it's valid even for today, but certainly didn't apply in, in, earlier, in earlier centuries. Um, the, the, the were you know there was a spectrum and, and there were people along different points along this spectrum I mean, if you take a figure like David Hume the great Scottish philosopher um, he was I think pretty much explicitly an atheist uh, and certainly to all intents and purposes um, so you've got kind of if you like somebody like that at one end of the spectrum and then you've got somebody like um, um, or Descartes to, to use a French example Descartes was a very religious man um, and, and again, a scientist and a mathematician. Um, so th this modern sense that, that, that there's something incompatible about reason and faith and about science and, and religion um, is not one which would find much resonance then, I don't think. Mm. Uh, and maybe there's a lesson in that for us now because we all of us, um, well, I, I think we, who am I to say, but I, I, I suspect we all kind of need to wrestle with this um, the fact that we've got powers of reason and we are called to be, uh, I think, faithful Christians and understand who are subject to the revelation. Um, what does that, how do you integrate those into, a, into, a, into, a, into an integrated approach to your faith and your worship and your life and your, and your reasoning um, is, I think, a, I think, a challenge for all of us, really. Mm -hmm. There's a great interview uh, by John Lennox, the professor of mathematics, a retired professor from Oxford mathematics, of course, a deeply committed Christian, uh, reconciling and talking about science, answering different questions to those answered by revelation. But yeah, that's good. Mm. But it's also still true today, interestingly, in Cambridge, one of our reasonable universities, where there are more Christians in the um, science faculties than there are in any of the other faculties. Mm -hmm. Probably including the theology one. <laughs> <laughs> one reflection that um, came to mind, and I wonder what your reaction to this is, Stephen, uh, hearing of how Watts introduced new thinking as far as worship in, in church, in the congregation, uh, and the use of psalms, um, the parallel perhaps with the, the renewal movement of the last 30, 40 years, which has brought, um, for good or ill, um, a, a whole load of songs, some of which are not memorable, uh, but uh, introduced a, a new a life into congregational worship, and many of which actually spring uh, from the Psalms. Have you reflected on that? I haven't. I perhaps should. Um, I, I, what, what I did, what did occur to me was, was in, that, in a sense, what he was grappling with um, was a challenge that, that, that's in some way quite parallel to the to the challenge of, of modern worship. That is to say, of using um, uh, words and music in a form that, that connect with a much broader range of people um, than traditional churchgoers has been has been something. It, it has been what, in many ways, the modern renewal movement has been trying to do, um, um, and that is precisely the challenge that that he saw himself as facing in the early 18th century. Um, uh, it, it is. I hadn't. Uh, thought about that. It is interesting that, that, that some of the, some of the, the band music that 
we use in St. Barnabas is, 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 is taking phrases from Psalms. It's an interesting thought I hadn't thought about. Stephen, that was the point I wanted to pick up on that the, in the 90 minutes prior to this meeting, I was in a, a dull but um, a somewhat pedantic church meeting. I'm sure none of you have ever been to one of them, but it was about trying to appoint a new minister and we were trying to candidly write um, what had gone right and what had gone wrong. And we were reflecting that whilst we had embraced um, new technology through the pandemic, that um, our innovation in, in worship and music had been less so because we love the traditions to which we are wedded. And was that appropriate when you are um, on the doorstep of a huge student community who doesn't relate to it in the way that, that we might? And I mean, there is something extraordinarily affirmatory to think 300 years ago, there were groups of Christians sitting having the, you know, confronted with the same dilemmas. And also I thought to choose um, for someone who was clearly such an intellectual giant of his time to wrestle with the religions of the word have to appeal to the heart. And it is not a, it's not a betrayal of their theology to appeal to the heart and sometimes distill things to their essence. Because of course the essence of, as you described it, this was not a hymn about um, personal salvation. It was absolutely about um, witnessing to the world. And, and, and I just thought it was affirmatory having sat in a pretty, difficult meeting, you know, trying to write about what sort of minister and what sort of worship and whether the technology or the liturgy, where we were in them to think, this is the essence of what it is to be a witnessing Christian. And it was true 300 years ago. And it's, it's, it, it's every bit as true to, it's every bit as true to uh, today. So thank you for that. And I hope you do it next. Can I just say, I don't know if anybody else has, it would be fantastic to choose another four uh, carols and do it all again next year, because there's so much to learn. And it's, it's it's joyful. Thank you. Wendy, it was, can I say very good to see you and hear you? Um, I know you've been uh, um, on at least some of the other ones. I don't know whether uh, all of them, but some of them. And it's very good to hear you. And, and I'm only sorry that uh, I think all four of these examples are really rather English ones. I feel that if I'm going to do it again, I pick a Scottish one. <laughs> Some French ones too, actually. You've had some lovely, the Advent things has had some lovely French and, yeah. and, and, and maybe some Lutheran ones as well too. There's lots to, there's lots to choose from, but. Uh, well, there, are, there, are, there are two, there are two, two Germans on this screen I can, I can see. So I'm certainly going to include some great Lutheran ones another time. <laughs> I was looking up the number of um, uh, Psalms that have been turned into hymns. Cause I was thinking as you were talking, well, I wonder how many there are. And one of the websites was talking about 140, just for starters. I thought, my goodness. And some of them have had two or three, two or three songs or hymns written about them. It's extraordinary, really. I mean, not all that well known, to be fair, but um, it's still a goodly number. So um, for me, Joy to the World is not a uh, Christmas carol that I grew up with. And um, when I came, first came across it in the UK, I think what, what sets it apart for me as a, as a carol is that a lot of carols are either a bit narrative or they are um, quite sort of gentle. Some of them are more like lullabies. And this is just outright joy. You know, it doesn't even try and tell a story much or anything. It just goes like, rejoice. And it's just so out there with it. I, I find it extraordinary. And you can just get caught up with it in a way that I think the, the other carols often don't do the same thing in that way. It's just like, it doesn't take any prisoners. You know, just rejoice. Go I, for it. I, I, and, I, and I just love that. I just love that kind of uncompromising joy that shines out of every line. I, I agree. I think it's, and, and it works. Uh, I, I think it works because of the music. As, the, the words yeah. themselves are, 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 I mean, they're, they're, they're not, I think, Isaac Watt's greatest, uh, greatest poem. Um, they're, they're, they're fine, but, but they're, they're not in the same league, I think, as 
when I survey, well, it's a personal view, of course, it's the music underpinning those words that turns this into this extraordinary outburst of joy, Andrea, which you, which you, which you uh, point to. And I think it's, it's, it belongs with things like um, the Alleluia Chorus from the Messiah. Um, it belongs um, with um, the Christmas Oratoria, that the, open, the opening choral, ch chorale of, of Bach's Christmas Oratoria, which I, uh, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by singing, but it, if, you, if, you need, uh, if you need just lifting up, any of those three things will do it for me. And um, as, uh, as I suspect we all feel, we could do with a bit of it at the moment. But isn't that precisely the point? I mean, it is not about the, the, the hymns that are deep in theology and have a, a, a message that it has layers and layers and layers of meaning that you could spend hours analyzing. That's not what people do who are just happy. You know, if you just express joy, it's got to be simple and it's not got to be like the world's most elaborate um, poetry. And in a way, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's good that the words are simple because otherwise you, you take away somehow from that outburst and that um, spontaneity feeling that comes with that music and I agree with you the music is incredibly engaging and, um, and, and sort of takes you in and sweeps you up um, but in a way it needs simple words yeah, because true. otherwise you end up just analysing it all the whole yeah. thing and that's not the point. There is quite a bit of theology in it I quite agree with the, the joy yeah. uh, but I mean it's the, the God creator, the king, no more sin, and, and the second coming as well. Uh, there's quite a bit sort of interwoven there. Yes, I'm not saying it's devoid of theology, but, um, and, and actually, I, I, as a general rule, I don't think I would go to carols for good theology on the whole. I mean, there's some really highly questionable stuff in there sometimes. But, it, but what I, my point is, is that it's straightforward. It yes, is it's not making it more complex than it needs to be. It's mm -hmm. God is good, he loves you, and be happy. At the same time, there's, there's, it reminds me of C.S. Lewis saying, you know, when we're, when we're happy and we're excited about something, we want everybody to join us. Yeah. And the fact that here he's actually invoking the whole of creation and calling on creation to rejoice. Yeah. It's quite, I mean, it's both very sort of like you get that in the Psalms a lot, but it's also quite modern in the sense that we, we've sort of awoken more, more recently to the sense that Christ's redemption is not just for human individuals, it's, it's for the whole of creation, it's to renew the whole of creation, that's quite a, a, a new theme again in theology, but, but there it is back in his, in his work, and I almost think of it as this is him, he's so excited, that he just wants everything to join in with him. If, and if that's the trees singing and clapping their hands, like in the Psalms, then, you know, that's, that's how far he'll go. And it's almost a spontaneous sort of overflow to creation itself. And, and that's it. That's amazing theology. I love that. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, can I, Stephen, can I just ask one last question? Um, I, I wonder, do we, you said that he was very popular in his time as a reformer, um, wanting to reform music, wanting to reform the church, things like that. How was he received within the church? Do we know that? Was he, was he a leader of a movement or, or was, there a, was, was, was he controversial? I, I, I'm not sure I know enough to give a full answer to that. The, the, uh, um, he, he was popular, um, main, his, his main way of exercising influence was through his writings and his publications. And he sold, I mean, he sold one of those, um, one of those things that I referred to, sold 70,000 copies. And this is in the early 18th century. You know, so he, he was clearly very influential. Um, was he controversial? Um, he will have been controversial with some because there were some around who believed that any tampering with the Psalms is tampering with the word of God. And he did tamper with the Psalms. See, that hymn is a loose interpretation of a Psalm. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and there were those who felt this was not the right thing to do. And, and I guess in that sense, there will, as at any time when you're, when you're pushing for change, 
um, there are going to be those who say the change is wrong uh, and resist you. Um, I, 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 I mean, he, he, was, he was not controversial in the way that John Wesley became controversial um, because John Wesley um, started as an Anglican clergyman, found he wasn't getting traction within the Anglican church of his day and, and effectively split off and set up what we now know as the Methodist movement. Um, a, a, a decision which was always controversial um, and deeply hurtful, by the way, to his brother, Charles Wesley, who disapproved of setting, of setting up the Methodist um, movement as something separate from the Anglican Church. Isaac Watts wasn't in that league. Um, on the other hand, he was much more um, in, in dialogue with the, the, the intellectuals of his day um, than probably John Wesley was. But I shouldn't go too far in this because I'll end up sounding like I know more than I do. <laughs> well, thank you. I think we, we need to wrap things up because our time has gone. But um, thank you, Stephen, not only for, um, for this week, but for every, each of the, the four that you, carols that you've opened up to us. And uh, yeah, we, I think we can give, give a, a round of applause. Uh, absolutely Great. fantastic. And uh, I, I'll definitely sign up um, to the idea that we, um, that we do this again. Um, either as a Lenten series or again as a as a you know an Advent theory, series, I think there's lots to dig into. Um, so thank you, Stephen, very much indeed. Um, I'm going to suggest we end as we began with uh, with a word of prayer, and um, perhaps just um, pondering on what you said right at the end, Stephen, that um, in these difficult times we we need um, joy, don't we? And uh, we, we probably um, need to be reminded that the joy doesn't primarily come from, from ourselves. It comes from a saviour who is born. Lord, we want to thank you for the uh, rich ground that we've been able to dig into over the last uh, four weeks. As we've looked at uh, different compositions, different poems, different uh, hymns that have found their way into um, this uh, Christmas tradition and uh, today um, we just want to thank you that uh, the Christmas story is absolutely a story of um, joy being brought to people who were um, in some ways in within themselves living in darkness or a sense of uh, exclusion or longing um, and then um, the angels brought joy and the joy of the of the baby Jesus and the joy of the promises being fulfilled. And Lord, in our day where um, there is so much um, darkness around us and so much uh, pressing in to discourage us, so much that we don't understand, um, Lord, we turn to you, we look to you. And uh, as we prepare to um, celebrate Christmas in a couple of days' time, Lord, we um, ask that your joy might flood our hearts, that you might touch us in our minds, but also in our hearts. Um, and uh, set us, as we prayed right at the start, set us on fire, Lord, with love for you. We pray for uh, a new sense of uh, wonder and awe as we hear the Christmas message, that it won't just be an intellectual exercise of uh, reliving the story, but that we might uh, find ourselves afresh uh, faced with you uh, and your amazing love for us. So thank you for uh, people like Isaac Watts, Lord, who, who took um, their, their intellect and they also took their heart and their emotions and they brought it together in their faith. And we pray that you would do a similar work in us, uh, bringing us together in, in you, that we might uh, discover new things this Christmas time and be set on fire for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm.